questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. And now I'm really pleased to introduce to you our, our speakers today. Um, Judy Hughes is a longstanding member of North Suburban Genealogical Society. She's served on our board for many years and is currently our social media chair. She also leads our DNA study group and our writers group. And as we begin, I would just encourage you all to follow along and you can see our website if you have any questions, our Facebook page. Yeah. And we welcome any members or any guests to join our society. We would love to have you as a member. Our writers group dates are listed here. If you're interested, you can go to our website and see that. Our DNA's discovery group is meeting April 29th. If you're interested in giving us a try, please reach, go to our website and the event calendar and you can find more information about that. We would be happy to send you a link. I would like to remind uh, Glenview residents that the Glenview Library is having a genealogy research night on April 15th in the evening. Please make a point, uh, put it on your calendar and if you're interested, Please attend. We have a number of um, volunteers in our society and the first Wednesday of the month, uh, some of our members do a drop in genealogy at the Northbrook Public Library. If you have questions, you're welcome to come on up to the second floor and we're there to answer anyone's questions. Our society also has a virtual drop in at, and you can uh, pose a question and we can link up your question with people in our society who have a talent and a knowledge in that area. And we can come back, get you together and help you further your research. Uh, the Glenview Library also has its genealogy room with many volunteers. Some of them are in our suburban um, genealogy society members. Here's some of our upcoming uh, North Suburban meetings, our May and our June. You are all welcome to attend as guests. So as I was saying, Judy is our, our lovely uh, member of our society. Uh, she and Mike are residents in Northbrook and they have three grown children. And Judy, I've learned has devoted her life to public service. Um, and both not only in like appointed things, but she's even been elected to uh, specific offices. Currently, she is serving as the president of the Northbrook Historical Society, and she has been in that position for 22 years. She is certainly a devoted um, servant of the community. She has also co-authored two books about Northbrook history. Um, at this point, I want to turn the presentation over to Judy and her talented uh, dynamic cousins, Michelle, Helen, Angelica, and Beth. Thank you. Setting up as I'm get this all set up. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off because um, I'd really like you to uh, pay attention to the documents and then um, if you can move the camera around um, if you have it just in speaker view that will help so you'll have more space uh, I'm not sure that my since my slides fill the whole screen I'm not sure how easy it will be for you to see some of the some of the things in the slide. So I'm going to turn off my camera somehow. Yeah, there I go. And uh, let's get started. So this is the story of a promise made long ago and how genealogy, DNA, collaboration and serendipity helped me find descendants of the men and women men, women, and children enslaved by one branch of my family. To tell the story, I will be showing family documents and public documents and using common research strategies to discuss the difficulties of doing African-American research. 
Even though we know the history of slavery, it is still devastating to see it spelled out in black and white. It is incomprehensible to understand how anyone could think that chattel slavery, where people were considered property with a price tag and no rights, was acceptable. If enslaver descendants like me find the documents I'll show you hard to view, can we begin to imagine the deep hurt experienced by their descendants? However, to make my dream come true, I knew I had to take ownership of what my family did while recognizing that their decisions have consequences we still feel today. Throughout this journey, I've been inspired by the strength, resilience, and perseverance of the families I have come to know. And I have been warmly welcomed and feel truly blessed to have built deep friendships with a group of their amazing descendants. Our story is a journey of discovery, collaboration, and friendships. It's also a story that was meant to be, and it is filled with serendipity, or if you prefer, God winks. It began in 1982 on a hot and sunny North Carolina summer afternoon when my cousin Anne and I were on a genealogy road trip visiting courthouses, churches, and graveyards. Driving through the town of Davidson on our way to our second great grandmother's grave, we passed a store with her surname on it and decided we just couldn't ignore the name on the store. So Anne parked the car and we went inside to see if anyone was that anyone there knew who anything about um, our second great grandmother, Margaret Malvina Johnston Withers, or her family. Bill Withers, the store owner, greeted us, and within a minute or two, we learned his ancestor was the son of the woman whose grave we were going to visit. He told us to go on up to the cemetery and he'd go he'd go home and get some things he knew we'd want to see, and he'd meet us in the cemetery. When he arrived, he handed us a box and told us that he was going back to work and that we should drop the box off at the store on our way out of town. It is here where my journey began, standing in front of the grave of Margaret Melvina Johnston Withers Williams, who died 140 years ago this year. As Anne and I stood there, we both took notes about each item in the box and Anne photographed them. Saving the family Bible for last, we documented the death notices pasted in the fly leaves and the items tucked between the pages. Then we turned to the center section to see what new family information we could glean. Whenever I think back to that day, I still feel the chills at what happened next. The family record page of the 1858 Bible belonging to Samuel Meacham Withers and Margaret Melvina Johnston Withers did not contain what we expected. Instead of our ancestors' dates of birth, marriages, and deaths, what we found were the names of 32 people that Margaret and her husband Samuel enslaved and the birth date for an unnamed baby born after emancipation. The mother's names were listed for many of the children. I knew my ancestors were likely to be enslavers. Even so, it was a huge punch in the gut to see it confirmed in the Bible. As a genealogist, I knew the information contained in the Bible was important to, their descend to the descendants of the people named. That day, I made a promise that some way, somehow, I would share the information with the descendants of the people my family had grievously harmed through chattel slavery. The question I needed to answer was how would I make that happen? Since there are so many women named Margaret in this story, I will use her first maiden and married names when talking about her. I will also ignore the names of her second husband because he is not relevant to this part of the story. The 1860 map shows the prevalence of slavery in North Carolina just prior to the Civil War. The three stars to the left show the counties where my enslaver families lived. My great grandmother's family is represented, great grandfather's family is represented uh, by the broken lines. They settled in coastal North 
uh, New Hanover County in 1801 and migrated to Bladen County, marrying into families who had settled there since the 1850s. Although, although they were enslavers, they are not part of the story I'm telling today. My great grandfather traveled to Mecklenburg County to attend Davidson College. And while there he met and married my great grandmother. After graduation, they returned to Bladen County where they lived for the remainder of their lives. <clears throat> the star closest to the top of the map represents my great grandmother's family. Her family settled in Mecklenburg, Iredale and Rowan counties in the 1750s. And it is her family this story is about. The star on the far right shows the two counties where my grandmother made her home after her marriage and where my father was born and raised. One of the first and most important things I learned was that I had to build my family tree back to the generations of enslavement and include all my ancestors, siblings, spouses, and children and continue the generations if I could. We will be concentrating on the Johnston, Torrance, Lawson families outlined in red. Also important are the Withers, McConnell, and Work families. The learning and discovery part of this journey took nearly 36 years. Occasionally we all hit a brick wall. It may take us longer to find information to verify we have the correct person or we may never find the information we need. At first, the records for enslaved African-Americans seem to be hidden behind a thick brick wall. While it is certainly more difficult to find African-American records, it is possible once you know where to search for the clues. Listening to family lore, doing good genealogy research and understanding historical information are the first steps to take when embarking on this journey. Knowing the enslaver's name is often the key to finding information you need. As we move through this part of the story, I'll be using documents for many of the, ca the categories listed on the screen. And this list is included in the handout. One thing to remember is that the names of free people of color are included in census records. The names of the enslaved are not included until 1870. After emancipation, African-American genealogy is easier, although the records are still sometimes difficult to locate. Be sure to check out county borders before you begin collecting documentation. Mm. These are the North Carolina, North Carolina counties where my family settled when they settled in Rowan County. Here are the counties 30 years later in I, uh, in Iredale County is where they lived then. If I had not learned about the border changes, I may have missed locating pertinent records. As the story unfolds, I'll be showing you documents related to my second great-grandmother, Margaret Johnston Withers family, beginning in the 1770s. Actually, they begin in the 17, 1757. Um, the document will not be in the orders they were found, or in chronological order, and some of them you'll see more than once. Land records can help to put the location in perspective. The 1757 survey on the left is for Hugh Lawson's land on Davidson Creek. The 1791 survey on the right is for Alexander Works 300 acres on the waters of Davidson Creek, bounded by the lands of James Templeton, Adelaide Osborne, and Adam Torrance. Always pay attention to who the neighbors are and the witnesses on the documents. Without moving, these two men lived in two counties during their lifetime. Today, this land is in Iredale County. Maps are an invaluable research tool, especially when the names of surrounding land holders are shown. The term fan club was coined by genealogist Elizabeth Schoen Mills. The research is also known as cluster research. Fan stands for friends, associates, and neighbors. Often these neighbors are witnesses to family documents. I've been to some of these places on the map, but it wasn't until I saw this map that I was able to begin putting the pieces of the puzzle together. 
Mayhew is now a town. Alexander Work, whose land deed we just saw is to the left of Center Church. Hugh Lawson isn't shown on this map. However, his son married John McConnell's daughter and his granddaughters married into the White and Torrance families. Torrance Tavern burned to the ground during Cornwallis's march in 1781. Pay attention to the loop in the river. I'll show you something in just a minute. Some of these people are buried on their own land as, they, as were the people they enslaved. Samuel Baker had a cemetery on his land where some of the early settlers were buried, including John McConnell, the Lawsons and Torrance's. In 1961, the bodies in Baker's cemetery were reinterred in the center church graveyard, while the bodies of their enslaved men and women and children remained buried on the land where they toiled. The reason they are reinterred is because Baker's cemetery and much of their land is now underwater. Duke Energy built a dam at Cowan's Ford on the Catawba River, completed in 1964. The dam created Lake Norman, the largest freshwater lake in North Carolina. The original riverbed is to the west of Mayhew and much of Davidson Creek of the Davidson Creek settlement is now underwater. Until 1850, only the heads of households were listed by name in the census. The other household members are listed in columns by gender and age. The last two columns on the right contain information on other free people and the total number of enslaved without their age or gender listed. There were 627 free people, including two free people of color and 261 enslaved people listed in the 1790 Iredale County Census. Living in, uh, living in Iredale County are members of the Work, Lawson, McConnell, and Torrance families. The Work and Torrance families are in the red box, living just across the border in Mecklenburg, where the Withers and Johnston families. This is the 1860 Mecklenburg County slave schedule. Heads of household were again listed. This time, the other columns represented information about the people they enslaved. According to Henry Louis Gates, there are only three counties where the enumerators ignored instructions and wrote the name of each enslaved person. Those counties in 1850 are Utah County, Utah, Scott County, Tennessee, and Bowie County, Texas. In 1860, Samuel Withers is listed with four adults two men, two women, and five children, one of which is listed with an M in the column for color. The M stands for mulatto, which is the term used in the census for people of mixed race. The last column shows how many dwellings were on his property. He also employed two mulatto men from Alexander Torrance's estate from 1843. James Johnston, whose name is next with the arrow, um, was um, Samuel Withers' father-in-law. He died in 1860. His estate shows 16 adults, 34 children aged 16 or under in, um, that he enslaved. 16 of the children are listed as mulatto. They all live <clears throat> in six dwellings. Some of the enslaved people may have lived in the Withers or Johnston homes on the same land. All of the Withers enslaved people and some of the people enslaved by the Johnstons are listed in the Bible. The first time the formerly enslaved appeared by name was in the 1870 census. One of the many decisions the enslaved had to make when they were freed was what name would they use? Some chose to keep their slave names and others didn't. And unless family stories were carried and passed down through the generations, this was the first time in their memory they would have a surname. Some people chose to use the last name of their enslaver. Others used the name of their mother's enslaver, while others chose a name they liked, such as Green 
or Johnson for the son or daughter of John. Sometimes after living with that name for a few years, they changed it again. This is one of the reasons good genealogical research is so important. Enslaved families were torn apart at the whim of their enslavers. Sometimes they were given as wedding gifts, sold or traded. When the enslaver died, he bequeathed his property, which included his enslaved people to family members or requested that the enslaved should be sold or set free. The Torrance family seems to have kept their enslaved people within the family, all of whom lived on the same land or within miles of each other for generations. Slave deeds are found with land records unless the paperwork was not recorded and kept with family members. The University of North Carolina Greensboro has an ongoing project called People Not Property to digitize slave deeds. This deed is in the Alexander Torrance papers held at the Duke University David M. Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library. This is a collection of about over 1,200 pages, and it is not available online. Church records are helpful. The enslaved may have <clears throat> attended church with their enslaver taking communion and having their children baptized. Marriage among the enslaved was recognized in their community. However, the legal system did not recognize their marriage. After emancipation, um, many chose to have their, to have a civil ceremony and have their marriage um, recognized. However, the date listed on the date is the date of registration in the civil ceremony and not the date of their original marriage. Charles Withers' parents are listed as Torrance's and his wife, Margaret, is the daughter of people we're about to meet. Charles and Margaret are listed in the Bible. Court cases can span many years and they can be heard in multiple courts. This deposition was taken 61 years after Adam Torrance died in a Revolutionary War battle in 1780. The child Dina listed here is the daughter of Charlotte. It is probable that she is the one enslaved person listed in the 1790 census with George Torrance. Charlotte's suckling daughter, infant daughter Duchess is also known as Dickie or Dicey. She and her daughter, Rachel Torrance Work, are at the center of this story. The next three documents are the wills of Adam Torrance, his wife, Anne, and two of their children, Margaret and Alexander. Adam and Anne Bona Torrance are the great grandparents of Margaret Johnston Withers. Anne's youngest children are Margaret and my fourth great grandfather, Alexander. They shared the 240 acre plantation left to them by their mother. Dickie, listed here, and this is a, uh, a part of the, the will, is the infant listed as Duchess in Adam Torrance's 1841 deposition. Her daughters, Rachel and Grace, are also named in the next will. Duchess, in Adam Torrance's 1841 court case, du uh, I'm sorry, Dickie is the infant listed as Duchess in Adam Torrance's 1841 case. Her daughters, Rachel and Grace, are named in the next will. When I began this research, one of the first wills um, that I got, that my cousin Ann got, um, she retrieved from the courthouse. And this is the 1841 will of Anne Torrance's daughter, Margaret Torrance. Now this will and others are available online. By following only my direct line and not building out my tree, I would not have recognized the importance of this document. Like the Bible, her will contains important information. It identifies her siblings, their children, and names many of the 30 enslaved people she bequeathed to them. It also held an important clue to what came next. Rachel is the daughter of Dice, the woman listed in Anne's will. 
Rachel and Free Henry Work are the parents of 11 children. They are part of the multiple generation family of at least 16 people named in this will. Margaret Torrance is the great aunt of Margaret Johnston Withers. In his 1843 will, Alexander Torrance bequeathed Suki to his daughter, Anne Torrance Johnston. Anne is my third great grandmother and the mother of Margaret Johnston Withers. He also requested that his Negro woman, Dicey, be free to choose a home with any of, her, of his children as she had been a faithful servant to her mistress. And he enjoined it as a duty to the one she may select to live with, to treat her with the kindness and indulgence she merited. Since Dicey's name does not appear in his probate files, it is likely Dicey died shortly after his death. This is the probate file of Alexander H. Torrance, the son of Alexander Torrance and brother of my third great grandmother, Ann Johnston Torrance. He died a few years after his father, Alexander, and his aunt, Margaret, whose wills we just saw. His probate record shows who bought the items at his sale. It also shows nine enslaved people who were rented out to neighboring families with the rent going back to his estate. The buyers and those who rent the services of the enslaved are usually neighbors, close friends, or family. James Johnston is one of the buyers. He is Ann Torrance Johnston's husband and the father of Margaret Malvino, Margaret Johnston Withers. It is important to remember that just because your family didn't live in the South, does not mean they were not enslavers. William Briggs' will stated 1716, and he lived in Little Compton, Rhode Island. The internet changed everything for me. Instead of having to go to courthouses, write for documents, or hire a researcher, I could stay at home and at any time, day or night, search for additional documents. Then Facebook and DNA were added to my toolbox. Facebook provided me with the opportunity to learn from others, ask questions, and seek guidance on where I would find more information. After discovering this Facebook page, I spent hours learning from others. And it was while I was here on this page in January 2018 that my dream finally came true. DNA is a game changer. However, by the time you get back to the generations of enslavers and, and the enslaved, the possibility of sharing DNA is dramatically diminished. My chance of sharing DNA with a fifth or sixth cousin is 15 to less than 5%. I was unable to use DNA from a generation closer because all my elders were no longer living when DNA testing became available. If they had taken a DNA test, just that one generation closer to the generation of enslavement and the probability of a shared match with descendants of people they enslaved would be 45%. Yet among my DNA matches are black men and women, which is a clear indication that one or more of my ancestors or their close relatives fathered children with enslaved women. For many of my matches, the most recent common ancestor may never be determined. Working with what I had, I set about finding and comparing my matches with those of my half sister, my late sister's children, and my first cousin to see if they had DNA matches that I did not have. The journey has been like putting together a huge jigsaw puzzle with each document a piece representing a piece of that puzzle. The 1860 slave census uh, schedule, which we've already seen, and James Johnson's probate file and the Withers Bible provide information covering a two-year time span. Together with the documents I have found, they provided the information necessary to identify nearly all of the people listed in the Bible. 
James Johnston's probate lists four fewer enslaved people than his 1860 census showed. Not shown are a 55 year old male, a 57 year old female and two children included are Margaret and Suki who were bequeathed to his wife, Anne. Like the Torrances before them, the Withers and Johnston families lived on the same land. In 1870, with both mother and daughter widowed, they lived in the same house. In addition to the multi-generations of the Torrance work family, a Margaret Torrance in her 1841 will bequeathed to her niece and my third great-grandmother, Anne Johnston Torrance, Margaret and her children and Mariah's daughter, Esther, to hold to her and her heirs forever. From the work family, he bequeathed one of Rachel's children, also called Margaret, to Anne Torrance Johnston's daughter and my second great grandmother, Margaret Johnston Withers. Both these emancipated women named Margaret are listed in the 1870 census within one entry of their enslavers. Margaret Byers is listed in James Johnston probate. Margaret and Charles Withers are listed in the Bible. Their marriage certificate, which we saw a few slides ago, lists her parents as H and R work. The tick mark in the red square or blue square shows that in 1870, Charles was a citizen and was able to vote. On the screen is the Torrance and work family of 16 that Margaret Torrance bequeathed to her siblings, nieces, nephews, and their children. She also bequeathed 17 other enslaved people to her family. As you've seen, Margaret Torrance was not the first to bequeath and hold members of this family as property. And you can follow members of this family through all of these documents. She was the third. And you can follow them from the 1870s to emancipation. Born in 1873, Suki can be followed from 1843 to 1865. She is most likely one of the unnamed children in the other wills, and she is the first name shown in the Bible. Margaret Johnston Withers' father died February 14, 1860, without a will. His estate was split between his wife, his 20-year-old son, James, and Margaret. Margaret's son, husband, Samuel, began writing in the 1858 Bible after the Johnston estate was settled in 1861. Both Margaret and Suki are listed with the 161 date, which would have the day they would have been inherited from James, Johnson, James Johnston. Instead, the first um, with the one, instead the list contains, um, you would think that all of these people came from James Johnston, but they didn't. Uh, the list contains Samuel's enslaved people, those inherited from his father-in-law's estate and both of the children and children born to both of them. Since women were not allowed to hold property in their name unless they were single or widowed, Margaret's husband, Samuel, became the official property holder. Samuel died on July 27, 1864. And using a pencil, it was Margaret who entered the information on the children born after his death and the mother's names. As a genealogist, I knew this, this information can, contained in the Bible was important to the descendants of these people. After nearly a hundred years and four generations of enslavers, Margaret Johnston Withers, daughter of James Johnston and Anne Bona Torrance, granddaughter of Alexander Torrance and Catherine Lawson, and great-granddaughter of Adam Torrance and Anna Bona became the final enslaver of these families. Because of what Mark Johnson wrote in the Bible, you've been listening to the story of the enslaved woman 
in the center of this precious tintype photograph. Her name is Rachel Torrance Work. You have been listening to the story of her grandmother, Charlotte, her mother, Dicey, and her 11 children, including her daughter, Harriet, work Lennox shown with holding the baby and Margaret not seen in the photo. I find it amazing that this picture exists and that it was passed down with family records and family lore. No such pictures have been found for the enslavers in my family. This is the power of storytelling. Through shared DNA, we have determined Rachel is my aunt and the half-sister of my third great-grandmother, Anna Bona Torrance Johnston. Alexander Torrance is their father. Rachel works 12-year-old daughter, Margaret, and my second great-grandmother, Margaret Johnston Withers, were first cousins. They were both young children, just 12 years old and nine years old when the older Margaret was bequeathed to the younger Margaret Johnston Withers. The next part of the program is how my promise was kept and how the circle widened into what we call our Torrance Cousins group. It is also why I think this is a journey with missed opportunities, lots of serendipity, um, and the resulting friendships were meant to be. Our group of Torrance cousins come from all over the country. Georgia, Michigan, Illinois, and Washington, DC are just a few of the places we call home. None of us knew each other when we began this journey. We all have a genetic DNA match with one or more of the group. And we have about 15 people, although there's five, six, eight, seven that are um, actively researching. Um, and some of us are joined together uh, by long, long ago community connections rather than direct uh, descendants. No one is related to every member of the group. I was welcomed with open arms from our very first contacts. In 2019, Helen and I spent a week together in North Carolina at the North Carolina Archives, and Michelle joined us for a day of research. Some of us were together last night for a virtual book club, and sometimes we get together to tell our stories or share research. While COVID may have kept us physically apart, it has not dulled our enthusiasm and our joy of working together or of being with each other over Zoom. And it's my honor to welcome Michelle, Helen, Angelica, and hopefully Beth has been able to join us by now to tell the next part of the story. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Johnson, and I'm coming to you this afternoon from Charlotte, North Carolina, um, in the community in the area where a lot of the story uh, takes place, at least my branch of the tree. Uh, but I live in Brunswick, Georgia. Um, I have not been doing research for 30 years like Judy or how many every years it was. Um, I'm actually fairly new to the research part of family history. Uh, my mother, who passed away 11 years ago, was our family historian. And I you know, would tag along with her um, as a young child, as a teenager, even as an adult, because I was a writer. And I loved to write about the people that she learned about, but I wasn't necessarily interested in you know, collecting documents and, and creating a tree. I didn't even have, any, have an ancestry account until um, my mother died. Um, so, you know, but I was, I was fascinated by the stories. I loved to write about the reactions that I would see when people were telling the stories to my mother. And so that was my part. And I, I wrote a newspaper column. And so a lot of those stories would be published in the newspaper column. But um, when my mother passed away, she asked me to continue her research. And it was a daunting task. I went up to her, um, her loft where she kept all her papers and realized that there were boxes and boxes of photographs and, and um, old faded um, census records from when she would have to go to the National Archives and you know, get things when we lived in Washington, DC. And so I inherited all these papers and, and had to try to make sense of it. Um, so I, I was hooked though, I became fascinated by it. And these papers went back to 1970. That's how long ago she was doing research. I was born in 1966. 
So she'd been doing it for a long time. And there were lots of questions in her paperwork. You know, she would have a note to say, I need to ask mom about this. You know, who was this person and how was he related to us? And, and one of the mysteries in our family involved the, um, uh, what my second great grandfather, whose name was Frank Lytle. And he was born enslaved in 1854. His mother, Mary, was born in 1830. Um, Frank was taken from her um, shortly after he was born, according to our family history. Uh, we knew his father was a white man, but we weren't quite sure who he was. Um, the family story was that his name was Rutledge Withers. And so that's what was in my mother's tree. That's what's in a lot of my cousin's trees. And that was like, that's who he was. Um, but after my mom died and I started doing research, I realized that first of all, Rutledge would have been too young, I believe, to have fathered a child. Um, and, and then the DNA wasn't quite making sense to me either. And I wasn't finding any answers there. Um, so it was like a, a big hole in our tree and I wanted to know. And so, um, like Judy said, the internet changed everything. Facebook groups began forming. Um, I did join the I've Traced My Enslaved Ancestors and whatever the name of the group is. It's a very long name. I joined that group and that's a group where people come together from the enslavers and enslaved and compare notes and try to help each other find the answers. So one night, almost four years ago, I posted a photograph of my grandmother and one of her first cousins standing in front of Frank Lytle's house, um, not too far from where I am right now. In fact, it's probably three or four miles from where I am right now. Um, and I said what I just told you, that we have this family legend that you know his father was this man named Rutledge Withers, but that's not quite making sense. And if there's anybody out there who can shed some light on this, you know, I'd really appreciate some guidance. And within minutes, Judy posted and said, we need to talk. This is my family. You know, we need to compare notes. And I think it was the next day that we agreed to talk on the phone. Uh, and it was very emotional. And I will admit that I've always known that my family had white ancestry. Um, you could look at my grandmother and especially in her generation and the generation before her, there were very fair skinned people, you know, blue, green eyes, red hair, blonde hair. You know, so it was obvious. And I knew they were my family, but I never thought of them as my family. You know, I just, these are those people over there. I don't need to deal with that. I don't need to look into that. But, you know, meeting Judy and also learning from the, the Facebook group and, and other um, genealogy groups that I've joined, you have to collaborate with the enslavers. You have to work together. You have to see their family papers. They have to share their family papers if they want to help us um, because our families are intertwined. There's no getting around the fact that all of these families work together, live next to each other. They were all witnesses on each other's documents. All these names keep coming up over and over and over again. You know, Beth and I are always saying, well, look who signed this, you know, look who's on this person's will, look at this name, you know? And it's like, all of these families were interacting with each other. With each other the white people and then their enslaved people were being shuffled around between plantations, leased out, borrowed out, you know, and women in particular were very vulnerable. You know, we might think of, you know, that maybe the father was the, the woman's owner, but that woman came in contact with men throughout her daily life who could have taken advantage of her, raped her. So you can't just automatically assume that the father was the person who owned her. And um, we also know going back to when these people, when women were brought from Africa on the slave ships, they could have been raped on the ships as well, or before they even got on the ship. So it's much more complicated than I ever thought to imagine um, before I became a part of this group. But there are, I think, 14 of us now, maybe. I'm not quite sure. Um, after Judy and I connected, we thought there must be other people in our little circle of families here that you know could could join us and and we can share notes and it just sort of blossomed from there helen came in and then angelica beth i mean they're there and there's there are more of us who are actively researching and finding connections all the time we're constantly emailing each other sharing documents i mean i basically started an email account just for this group because we were sharing so much i wanted to keep it all in one place so that's my part of the story um, i'm going to pass it on to Helen. And I guess eventually if someone has a question for me, I'll, I'll add more, but we'll let Helen share some of her story now. 
Thanks, Michelle. Um, this has been an exciting part of my life. I'm, I'm Helen and I live in uh, Lansing, Michigan, state capital, and I'm a retired law school professor. And it was interesting for me how many of the cousins were involved in um, library um, or teaching or writing or various aspects of using words. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, my third great grandfather was Henry Work. He was freed by Colonel Alexander Work in North Carolina in um, 1809. Well, actually, he was freed in a will in 1806, but the probate of the will took until 1809. And the person who was the executor of that uh, probate estate was um, it later became a governor of the state of, of North Carolina. So he ran into with some fairly important crowds in uh, North Carolina. He also had a lot of money. He had two plantations. He uh, had things in his uh, state inventory like um, mahogany this and crystal that. And that was all very interesting. So um, Henry Work was freed. He was listed in uh, Colonel Work's will as Henry, um, 10 years old, of yellow complexion. And well, if that's not a clue, <laughs> I don't know what is. And he, he was freed, his mother was freed, and his um, mother's aunts and uncle were uncles who were all freed. There were uh, close to 100 other slaves between these two plantations who are not freed. So this is of some significance um, in telling the story. Now, Henry and his wife, Rachel, um, Rachel was the woman in the center of the photo. And that photo that Judy's been showing is a teeny tiny tintype. I mean, it's like two inches by three inches. And it is amazing that it survived all these years. That is from my great aunt Hattie, and I'll mention her in a minute. Um, but Henry was freed. He and his wife, Rachel, who was enslaved, and she appears in these wills, as do her children, um, had 11 children. And when Henry was freed, Somehow he became uh, an expert brick maker and brick layer. And I say, well, it's at a time in North Carolina when there was a lot of money and you displayed your wealth by having the largest brick, whatever, home or mill wall or whatever you could make out of brick. So it was a good time to be a brick maker. He had a small crew and um, they were kept very busy. He had documents that had a lot of important names on it as um, uh, witnesses or as men who signed for notes that he would take, um, loans. Um, Davidson's were prominent, the Torrance's were prominent in these documents. And so Henry had something going. I mean, it was more than just being the son of Colonel Alexander Work. It was uh, something more. He must have had a great personality and work ethic and all of that. So Henry was freed. He um, carried on his trade. Um, he and his wife, Rachel, who was enslaved. And a child of an enslaved woman continues and is an, uh, a slave. That's the way it has been or was since um, the Roman times. So that was carried on in, in the uh, states and the colonies. Henry somehow raised enough to buy a significant number of his children out of slavery. He uh, bought these children or traded or did work or somehow he was able to free all but four of his children from slavery. Now, one of the children who was not freed is my second great grandmother, Jane. But all the other members of the family, besides Jane and her three adult siblings who were not freed, they all went from North Carolina to Michigan. And this is part of that westward movement that was going on historically at the time. And they settled in uh, southwestern Michigan. 
and they appeared in the 1850 census. So we have them documented there. Um, and you have to think about when families decided who they were going to free, if they didn't have enough resources to free everyone, they would have to choose the first, the most vulnerable, the youngest, the females, as Michelle was talking about, and then perhaps the ones who could help um, raise more money to support the household or to free other remaining members. Well, Henry died and he was, he was a farmer, owned land in uh, Michigan, but he was only here for five years before he died. So Rachel, um, the woman in the photo, and her children and her in-law, now son-in-law by this time, went from Michigan to Kansas. And that's where we always thought our story is beginning. I don't know why we thought our family came, but they did come from Kansas. We didn't know anything about North Carolina. And when we started getting documents that North Carolina, how does that work? Well, it was Kansas, uh, North Carolina, Michigan, then Kansas, but that was a complete surprise. But great aunt Handy was my um, great aunt in our Kansas City, Kansas, who um, was widowed in 1940, but that didn't slow her down. That didn't stop her. She had, she would come to Michigan by train every year uh, during the summer because it was too hot in Kansas. And these photos and stories and other things came from Hattie. Um, she was a character. She had stockings with the seams up the back. And even when she was in her 80s, she had to be just right and put her rouge on and all of that. She was a wonderful lady. So um, that's kind of the, the broad brush of my family history with these folks. But um, when Judy's talking about serendipity, and things, missed opportunities. I had hired a professional genealogy researcher um, and I've only had wonderful researchers in the, the time that I've been doing research um, who was doing work. She lived, this woman lived in Kansas and she was doing work out there and she was able to secure papers from back rooms and basements and places that I could not have gotten into because of the distance. Um, and Judy reached out to this researcher because she became aware of some things apparently that looked like we had in common, which we did, but then we never got in touch with each other. And Judy can probably add more to that. I, there was a health, issue going on and, and uh, um, other reasons. But finally, talk about the internet. Finally, we were able, thank you, Judy, to make contact. And um, it's been wonderful. Like I have shared photos, other cousins have shared photos. People have put stories together that I never would have known about. I just feel so lucky to be part of this group of cousins that, um, for the most part, I did not know existed and would not have known about if someone hadn't reached out to me. So very much appreciated. I'm going to now toss things over to Angelica, who's got some different stories relating to being related to people in the group. Angelica. Thank you, um, Helen. I, I love hearing all of these stories. I love hearing from my cousins. And every time I hear these stories, I learn something new. Um, I'm Angelica Roberts, uh, living in southwestern Michigan. I've lived in other parts of the country, but came home to Southwestern Michigan where uh, many of my ancestors uh, decided to settle. Some of them um, from North Carolina. Um, Helen and I are also descended from uh, another family from North Carolina, free people of color who, who came to Michigan. Um, like Helen, I am descended from Rachel 
and Henry work, Rachel being the woman in the center of the tintype that was passed along in Helen's family. Um, Henry is not in that um, tintype. He had passed away by then. Um, I did know some things. I had clues about my family because storytellers had passed along um, some pieces about um, Henry and Rachel's daughter, Harriet. Harriet is in that tintype holding a baby. And um, Harriet's husband, Nathan, who was standing behind Rachel. So they bought a farm um, not too far from where I am in Kalamazoo County. They, they bought a farm in the next county over. And some of their land was passed along in our family. So sometimes there are ties to land, even when you don't have um, concrete stories about where your people came from. Some things are passed along that way. Some things are passed along through photographs. Um, but I was fortunate to have some clues and I knew I was related to Helen, even though I hadn't met her because there were older generations of my family who understood that we all came from, from Harriet and, and from Nathan. Um, so in 2019, I reached out um, to Helen and connected. I, I sent an email. She was actually um, with her family doing a uh, family history tour. It was a cold day in November. So I knew we were related when I learned that they were going to cemeteries when it was so cold. <laughs> and um, so we've been in touch since then. And Helen opened up my um, understanding of um, Harriet, um, Harriet's past, which means Rachel's past and then going back. And so I knew about Judy and learned about other cousins. I would say I reached out to Judy, but really, you know, she has to take credit because Judy, you had your hand out. <laughs> you were reaching out, you know, so there was someone to touch when I reached out. I mean, you, you were ready to share everything you had, um, you had learned. So I've learned so much more. I am so appreciative for this group. I have not done DNA testing, but I, I know um, for sure about many of our relationships. Um, and I've learned and most of all, I have hope for the planet, really, for our society, certainly, um, that we can live differently and treat one another differently because these are people um, in this group who are respecting the truth of history and um, helping to ensure that stories live. So, I am grateful. Thank you, Judy, for all you've done and for all of you for sharing what you've done. And credit has to go to, to um, a cousin from an enslaver family, Beth Torrance. And Beth, I'm going to pass things over to you and you can, um, you have done so much and you can you know, give a sense of all that you have um, gathered and shared. Thank you. Um, I'm Beth Torrance. Uh, I live in uh, Stone Mountain, Georgia. Um, I was actually born in Alabama. Um, that's where my mother's family was from. I, I should start by saying my, my father died when I was 11 and I had not had contact with him for probably almost close to two years before he died. And subsequently, I didn't know much about his life. Um, I didn't know anything about his history and his mother was from Virginia. I knew that because when we buried my father, it was in Virginia. So I thought that's where his family was from. Um, so I didn't learn about the North Carolina part until my brother died in 2004 and I packed up all of his stuff and brought it to my house. And when I moved into my new home, I was unpacking his boxes and I found a folder of his research. And he had an entire Torrance family tree that I found out later he had gotten from my aunt June, um, my father's sister. And he had built a tree on Mind Spring, which you can't get to anymore. Um, but I have the paper copy. And so that fall, I joined Ancestry and I took all of his 
information and I put it on there. And then I kind of just left it. And I moved on and I worked on my mom's family. I worked on my brother-in-law's family. They were immigrants from Poland. And I thought this is, you know, an interesting project for me. I did my in-laws family, um, but I never really went back to the Torrances. And then I did DNA testing um, in early 2018. And immediately when I got my results back, I put them on GEDmatch because I was like, I want to know who I'm related to. I want to find all the people. And that summer I heard, I got an email from Michelle out of the blue that she had found me on GEDmatch and recognized my last name and knew there was a Charlotte connection. I was like, yeah, my dad was born in Charlotte. I do know that. Um, but I really didn't know anything about the Torrances. I really didn't. Um, you know, there were, you know, I knew there was a tavern. Um, and, you know, I knew, you know, one of my ancestors had been captured at Gettysburg, you know, those kind of stories. Um, but other than that, I didn't really know anything. So all of this was completely new to me um, in 2018. Um, so, we shared our family trees and Michelle saw, well, that I had the same ancestor that Judy had because she'd already been in contact with her. So then we started talking with Judy and then Judy introduced me to Helen and it just went on from there. And it was really that summer was, or that, yeah, that summer was the first time I had read any Torrance will. I had not read a single one of their wills I had no idea. I mean, I knew they were enslavers. I knew that we had we had talked about that in my family. My mother taught at a at, at an all black school here in DeKalb County, and she had more students named Torrance than any I had ever met in my life. Um, it was, and some of them were like, like that's what my name would have been if I'd been a boy. Like they there were. She had a ton of Torrance students. Um, and my cousin in California has a ton of Torrance friends. We've never met any other white Torrances though. Um, so we knew, <laughs> we knew. Um, but yeah, that was it. So that was, a, I actually had a huge learning curve that summer because I it was like, oh my God, look, there's all this information that I never ever looked at before. And so I started a notebook and started recording the wills. Um, and I would write down their names and the uh, relationships, like this is my niece, uh, the son of this person, the, you know, sister of that person, so that I could keep it all straight because they all had the same name. <laughs> they were all named Adam. They were all named Alexander. They were all named Margaret. And without writing it down, I would have never been able to keep it all straight. Now I've got it. Now I've got it, but at, at the time it was it was tough, and a lot of the information on ancestry was not very accurate because there's a book that was published about the Torrance and allied families, and the the information about our particular branch of the Torrance family is not well researched. Um, they focused more on the Pennsylvania and Ohio branches of the Torrance family and less on ours because it was one man who came here. So we don't even know for sure who his father was. We can assume, but we don't know. So I had to do a lot of correcting. I had to a lot of, do a lot of going back and proving that this person was related and this person was not, and this was not the same person. And there were you know, three different atoms that were all born within the same 10 years of each other. And one of them went to this state and one of them stayed there and, you know, whose children were whose. And it was, it, that was the starting point was just getting it all straight, getting all the Torrances straight, who belonged to who, who, you know, whose child was that. Um, so that was, it was like a crash course in genealogy for me. And then I sort of discovered that I loved it. I loved it. I loved that it had a purpose. And the reason why I was digging through these 
documents and, you know, straining my eyes at, at midnight was for a bigger purpose than just, you know, well, I'm related to that person. Yay. Um, so it, it, it never feels like work to me. Um, it's, and when I find that piece, that time, Stone Mountain keeps uh, Beth sometimes uh, freezing. She'll, she'll join us again in a minute. Tarrant's family sure. in this yep. step without a purpose. You know, I had their names. I knew who they were, you know, names and dates. Um, and that was enough for me until there was something else. So that's really been the biggest gift of all of this is that now I actually feel like I know these people. Um, I, I, I can go through wills, not Torrance wills, but other wills and say, that's Alexander Torrance's handwriting. I've seen it so many times now. He wrote that will. Um, and sure enough there, you'll see his name as a witness because he wrote it. Um, and so I, I feel really like I've gotten to know them through that. The tricky part is with DNA, like Judy and I are fifth cousins once removed. We don't share any measurable DNA, but we know we're related. Um, and I have probably thousands of people that I'm related to in that way because the Torrances never left. They, they were in Iredell and Mecklenburg for over 200 years. They just never left. So they intermarried with all of the other families. And I, I sit here and I go through and I'm like, oh, and now I'm back. I go a circle around and I'm back to the same people again. And I always think, oh, this is the line that's gonna be the DNA match that I've been looking for. I'm gonna figure it out. And then I'm like, oh, well, of course they married that person and that's their daughter. And then their daughter married that family. And I'm like, I could be related to them three different ways. And that was crazy to me that to, to, I had now have like 7,000 people in my tree and it just keeps getting bigger because I keep thinking, well, if I go down that road, maybe I'll find that, that one person that makes it all make sense. And I'm like, oh, but of course. Um, so that's been, that's frustrating. And also knowing that there's so many people that are from, I'm descended from that far back that I'll never know. Um, because we, I would have never met Judy. Um, we wouldn't have found each other on Ancestry because we don't match. But Michelle and, well, actually Michelle and I don't match on, D, on Ancestry, but her daughter and her sister match me on Ancestry. So we might have found each other. <laughs> but I, you know, but that's the crazy thing is that we know, Judy and I know how we're related and there's no scientific proof of that but we know um so dna is tricky it's tricky um and i wish that you know i had my brother had lived long enough to do his dna because that would have been amazing he was the last boy the last male in our direct line um and he would have loved it um he would have he would have been a part of this he would have he would have loved every minute of this um and i would have loved sharing it with him but um, that's, that's also a reason why I do this is that I think this is something that he would have really loved. So I kind of do this for him too. I, I, Beth is also being very, um, not telling the total part of her story because she is the research guru who has been putting all of the people enslaved by our family. Um, when Helen and Michelle and I were at the archives, uh, Michelle being the librarian that she didn't tell you all she was, uh, went on the computer and said, hmm, let's see what else, where else we can find some of papers to match our family. And she came up with a stack of papers at, that, at Duke University. So I got a researcher and got copies of the papers uh, that she photographed you know, in um, at Duke, 
And um, I looked them over and I sent a few pieces and there's over 1200 pages of paper. And I sent them off to Beth and you spent several months at least um, going through each of those documents and tying them in to the enslaved people and uh, to the different families that she's related to. And uh, we have an index, which Duke doesn't have. <laughs> and uh, she's been, uh, what did you say? It was your, it was your uh, hidden talent or your uh, something like that. That I, I, think I have a particular talent for names, um, and I don't. I I think I come by it naturally. My my grandmother was one of eleven. My grandfather was one of ten. Um, my other grandmother was one of eleven. Um, so I had a lot of great aunts and uncles' names to remember. I'm I'm the youngest of five, and we're all named for somebody. So it was important to keep our names straight. There's like eight living Sarahs in my immediate family, and so we know each other by our middle names in addition to our first names. So it's, I've always been good with names and I apparently am really good with names. <laughs> um, so that, yeah, I, I think I learned that was my, once I've written it down, I remember it. It's, I think it's my superpower. So do any, does anyone else have anything they wanna say? Um, the one thing I wanna say before we turn it over to questions to Terry, um, or Kimberly, whoever's gonna do the questions, is that um, for me, it was much more than just keeping the promise that I made myself. The most important thing is that now the information that I had and the information we're pulling together is out there and open to others. And it will be not in, not something I'm holding this, picture that Anne took of, of the Bible, but it it's something that will be there for generations and to share that research out to the community. As DNA, our DNA connections get less and less, this is going to be the way that people in the future that descend from enslaved people are going to be able to find that information. And it is so important that it's shared. And I also want to say that our little group is one of many little groups across the country that are doing this work. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you very today. much. This is a fascinating story and just the, the story as well as the collaboration just is just amazing to hear. So we really appreciate having you all here and talking about it. I'm Terry Jackson, by the way, I'm the program chair for the society and I'm here with Linda, the president. And if anyone has any questions, there are some already, um, please enter them into the chat. And uh, likewise, those that are um, here in person in the library, uh, ask those questions and Kimberly will put them in the chat for us. So our first question is from Leslie Winslow. And um, Helen, uh, you said Rachel, Henry, and their family moved to Michigan, but Rachel and four of the children were still enslaved. Can you kind of explain? I probably misspoke. Um, Ra uh, Rachel and Henry, Henry freed his wife, Rachel, and um, all that bulk of his family, children, from slavery. And they somehow made it the 400 miles from North Carolina to Southwest Michigan. The uh, second great grandmother of mine who was still enslaved and left behind was Jane. Um, and Jane was part of the Torrance household. She already had four children. And so I don't have a lot of information about Jane but um, she was not freed from slavery as were three, three of her siblings were not freed from slavery. But think about, you know, you've got Rachel and Henry freeing their children. Are they even gonna have enough to free their grandchildren? Well, perhaps not, or perhaps Jane wasn't ready to go. She eventually ended up in Kansas also after emancipation, but um, uh, she did not go with the rest of her family. And, 
it's, I haven't mentioned this. I'm not sure I've mentioned this um, to Angelica or any of the others, but you've probably noticed. I have two um, second great grandmothers who are sisters. And that's a whole nother story. And I had been fascinated by the legalities of slavery and emancipation and and uh, life during slavery in North Carolina, it got more and more onerous up right until the 19, uh, 1830s when Henry was like, I think I need to get out of here. And he eventually did with his family, but you, you couldn't carry a gun at some, at one point you couldn't meet with other free people of color. There was a lot of paranoia about slaves um, engaging in a revolt or um, other kinds of things that would cause paranoia. And um, so it became more and more onerous to stay in, even as a free person of color. So if, and um, Judy mentioned back at the very beginning that at one point there were only two free people of color in Iredell County, North Carolina. Well, you didn't have a whole lot to choose from if you were looking for a, a, a mate. So that Henry married, married a, uh, an enslaved woman, isn't that much of a surprise? Uh, the other, <laughs> the Margaret of the Bible is one of the ones that stayed with Jean or Jane because they she goes by both names uh, in North Carolina. Hiram was another one, uh, which is another member of our group's ancestor. And I believe the third one was Alex, who ended up in Southern Illinois at, after emancipation. And yeah, Helen, I, I actually was thinking about that when you were describing uh, that situation of, of him buying, um, Henry Work buying his family out of slavery. Um, and I mean, the legal, and maybe this is an answer, uh, you can't be answered, but the legal system at that time, did it handle that the same way, knowing that the person that was buying uh, them was for the purpose of freeing them? Um, there are all kinds of things that changed with the law of, man, or of freeing people from slavery. Um, at certain points of time, um, you had to leave the, the state if you were freed from slavery. And so that's when you might find a family of, of African Americans owning slaves because if they, if they freed, were free people of color, and they freed grandma or aunt so-and-so, if they didn't keep her enslaved, she would have to leave the state. It, it was just crazy how, um, so I never have found yet, and Beth can work on this for me, <laughs> deeds of the sale of my family. And that might be, I was told by a researcher in the archives down in uh, North Carolina, that it might be because there was bartering or services that Henry was doing that would not have come up with an actual sale. Okay, okay. I just like to, this is why I actually have a bone to pick with Margaret Torrance because um, she's the one that separated all of the works. And I'm grateful that she documented it so well in her will, um, but I believe that because she was given Rachel from her mother, um, that there was probably some tension with Alexander about that family. And when Margaret died, I think Alexander's conscience got the best of him. And he started allowing Henry Work to purchase his family because he knew those were his grandchildren. That's what I think. Um, there is, in the Torrance documents, there's an earlier probate record for Alexander Torrance that shows a note on Henry Work um, that's actually from 1842, which is right after Margaret died. And I think he immediately, once she was gone, started letting him have his family back. That's what I think. Um, so you can piece some of that together from the documents that you're yeah. looking at. Just from the timing of it, because it 
it started immediately after Margaret's death. Alexander didn't have a right to those people because they were technically Margaret's property. Um, they were they they were given to her, and he respected. He lived with his sister for I don't know fifty years. Um, so when she died, I think he he now had the freedom to do what he wanted to do. That's okay. that's what I think. Um, also, I, I think that like David Lawson, who's uh, uh, Alexander's son and my ancestor, his home was built in 1839, from what I understand. And I've always wondered if Henry Work was building it and his labor was paying for, for, their, for the freedom of his children. I, 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 I wonder about that as well, because the timing of it is all within five years. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's just my theory. That's my theory. <laughs> Thank you for sharing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there's a question from the room uh, that says, when is, will the book come out about this story? And I'm looking at you, Michelle, because you're a writer, right? <laughs> um, right? What kind of stories do you write, Michelle? Are you family stories or? Um, yes, mostly family stories. Okay. okay. And um, I have a novel in my head, like most people that I'm planning to write one day. Okay, great, great. Um, there's a few more questions. Um, someone in the room says, I have the Bible record of my enslaver ancestor that includes his eight enslaved persons. How can I share this information and where can I post it? Go on that Facebook page. I found uh, my enslaved ancestor and his owner and their owner and share it there. Um, share it, um, that's one place you can share it. Um, depends on the state it was in. Um, share it um, with a local genealogy society in the area, with a historical society in the area because people may be looking in those areas. A library. Okay, someone else um, asked, maybe this is a related question. What is the name of the genealogy group that researches enslaved and enslaver connections? Um, there's, there's a lot of different groups. Coming to the table is one group of uh, enslaver descendants and enslaved descendants coming together and, and talking. And there is a uh, a portion of that that has a group that does do um, that works together on genealogy. Um, I'm not sure of a group that does the research um, as such, but there are there are. It depends on what state you're in. I mean, Michelle has a friend. Uh, that has a wonderful website that's put things together and they bring people together. She's part of a, is it Ujima? Ujima Genealogy of Coastal Georgia. Right, and you're, you're talking about um, a website called They Had Names out of Liberty County, Georgia. But that was an initiative that that particular person decided to do. And, and that's something that I do as well. I Whenever I find the names of enslaved people in my family and I can connect them to the enslaver and have other information about them. I just put them on my personal blog and I try to just put it there so that people will discover it. But I wonder if this person is asking about the Facebook group. I wonder if that question is actually about the Facebook group. Yeah, and uh, the Facebook group page, I've traced my enslaved ancestors and their owners. That's a link that's on the handout. Uh, so just in a minute, I'll repost the handout to the chat. Mm -hmm. Well, for those that didn't get it at the beginning. That's a good point. Uh, there's another question. Uh, isn't it unusual for the enslaved to be literate and keep such good notes when it was forbidden for enslaved to be able to read and write, especially in North Carolina? There were, there were lots of exceptions. There were lots of people who did learn to read and write secretly. Um, taught by white people or taught by other black people who had been taught by white people. So there are examples of people who could read and write. And, and are we talking about um, Henry Work and um, his record keeping? The question came from the room, so I'm not. Okay. 
Um, it, there is another question, would Henry Work have any relationship to John Work, who was a great arranger of Negro spirituals? I saw that and uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, we can account for most of Henry's children, so it, it could have been a descendant. Um, he also had a brother uh, who was uh, freed at the same time that he was, so I don't have an answer. It's a possibility. It's a possibility. <laughs> um, what's your advice on how to find a researcher? Anyone? I found my researchers um, kind of by word of mouth. There's a national organization that certifies genealogy researchers. And um, I think actually a researcher that I used in North Carolina went, went to that page and picked out someone who was in Kansas near where my family was. So, and it, it worked out beautifully. I know we haven't had that topic recently, but I know other genealogy societies around have had uh, specific topics on how to hire a geneal uh, research genealogist. And state, state genealogy societies usually have a list of researchers, accredited researchers. You can go on the, on the webpage of the accredited researchers and find uh, where they are in different places, different states. And Judy, what are the names of the books that you wrote? Um, I wrote, uh, I co-wrote is... two, uh, two books on the history of our village. Uh, one is called uh, Northbrook, Illinois, The Fabric of Our History. And the other's just called, it's an Arcadia book, one of those little brown books. Um, and it's just called Northbrook. Okay. And uh, someone posted Michelle, uh, so Michelle Wolock. Uh, says that Beyond Kin Network mm -hmm. is a place to share enslaver information that brings people together. And uh, Linda, do you want to read this? I did mention uh, coming to the table, cool. which is a group, uh, a national group that's been around for a very long time. Um, but for those in uh, this area, uh, there is now a uh, coming to the table group in Chicago. Okay, and Medora Sharp said, this is so interesting. My grandfather is from Wake County. He left North Carolina in 1900. And I have not found anything beyond his parents. This gives me a lot of places to look. Family lore says that he was a father, says his father was a deserter and his mother was in, with the Civil War. So um, Gail Santrock says, this is an excellent presentation. And I would agree with her on that. Um, and Terry has reposted the handout. And I think that you will find links to some of the um, uh, places that you have mentioned. And I was wondering, Michelle, is your blog on, um, Judy, is Michelle's blog on that? I forgot to put it on. Okay. That's okay. Michelle, you... My blog is called carolinakindred.com. CarolinaKindred.com. Does anyone else have any other questions? Well, then I really want to thank you ladies for coming and sharing your family story. I think when you have a group to work together and you're wonderful women, it just makes it so much fun to um, learn about your family together. So thank you very much. And I want to thank um, the library for hosting this with us and everyone for attending today's meeting. Okay, so thank you. Terry, you wanna add anything? Uh, just that we hope to see you next month. Uh, next month we'll be at Wilmette Library and we'll be meeting in person there and uh, check our website for more information on upcoming uh, topics. So uh, in presentations, again, thank you very much all uh, this has been really great. Thank you, Angelica, Helen, Michelle, Beth, and, and Judy. This was very special for us, I think. And thank you all for attending. And uh, we'll see you next month, maybe, hopefully.
Bye now. Goodbye.